Hey everyone, I'm Scott, and does that countdown make anybody else nervous or give them anxiety, or is it just me? I see the countdown coming, and I'm like, all right, here we go. Uh, first of all, welcome again to the fifth installation of our HEB's online virtual cooking class. We're so happy you are sharing this time with us. It is 5.30, it's time to go. Uh, we got a jam-packed class full of great information, full of a lot of great tips. Um, what have we done so far? So in our series, we've done some great baking, right, Charlotte? We've done some uh, great appetizer. We did a great kids baking class. We did the wine uh, class. And now it's on to the main event, the main dish of our holidays. So we're going to focus in on three different recipes. Number one, you can obviously see this beautiful slab of meat in front of me, which I'll describe in just a second. Uh, the menu for tonight, uh, if you got a pen and paper, we'll take notes. Um, we have our uh, prime ribs. We're doing a holiday style prime ribs, super simple. We're going to take all the intimidation out of this giant expensive piece of meat. That just felt like there was less anxiety in that whole thing, right? Uh, French style mashed potatoes. We're going to show you a really simple way to make some great buttery, creamy, super smooth mashed potatoes um, that'll make any table uh, sing. And then uh, roasted fennel with a little bacon and rosemary crumbs. So if you have not used fennel, fennel is one of my very favorite, uh, I would say very favorite vegetables. It um, is. Charlotte knows this to be true. I do a lot of fennel. Uh, fennel seeds, fennel fronds, fennel pollen. All fennel, the fennel, 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 forms. fennel, fennel. I'm going to show you how to use this. We're going to talk about a little bit about the flavor. Don't want you to be intimidated by the fennel. It does have a slight anise flavor. We're going to kind of demystify some stuff. But the main event of the whole thing, uh, first of all, if you plan on cooking along with me right now, I want to let you know you may be a little disappointed because this meat will take longer to cook than just an hour. I'm happy to try, and if you're going to do it right now with me, I'll be happy to jump on at 9 30-ish, almost 10 o'clock just to check in, see how you're doing. <laughs> they may or may not be here to go to go with me, but, we'll, but we do want you uh, to head on over to our YouTube channel, HEB YouTube. Uh, you can check out all the last videos that you just watched. Um, so like the charcuterie, because we know obviously holiday gatherings may be a little smaller, but nonetheless, you may be gathering. So there's a lot of great information on there. Uh, the kids baking, you can go back, right? We watch everything. There's the charcuterie with Bernice. Charlotte, all that great information, how to make your charcuterie tray, take all the intimidation totally out of it. We have the, uh, you can always revisit the pies. If you're doing turkey, go back and look at the turkey video. There's always the wine. We had a great wine class. And then um, coming up this week, there's two more classes. We're excited about those. I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Right now, let's get to the main event. So we're going to do a little prime rib. So what is the prime rib? So the prime rib, so when you think about a steer or a carcass, and I'm not going to get too descriptive, there's eight primal cuts of beef and this uh, primal cup, the prime rib or the standing rib roast comes from the rib, which is the forequarter of the, uh, of the, so it's like in this area. And there's usually a separation between ribs. I don't have to get real technical because I'm not a meat scientist, but you, uh, <laughs> I want to make You're sure. You're doing I'm good, chef. You're doing good. And then, uh, so right, it's a very, very tender cut of meat uh, where this lies. So this is also known as the ribeye, but with the bone in, we call it the standing rib roast. Now, if I were to cut this up, I could debone this and cut it, you'd have a beautiful prime ribeye that you could grill on the grill, throw it in a cast iron pan, whatever you want. But for the holidays, we like to do this bone-in standing rib roast. Now, a little difference between the quality. So every prime rib is a standing rib roast, but not every standing rib roast is a prime rib. What does that mean? That means that we're using a grade prime standing rib roast, but there are choice and select as well. You don't have to use the most expensive. This piece of meat that you're looking at right here is definitely not inexpensive. But that's why we want to do this class to show you if you're going to pay the money to do this along with us for this beautiful piece of prime rib. We want to show you the perfect way to do it and take all the intimidation out of it. So Make it starts sure with this. Right. Get a question? Nope, you're good. No, so Sorry, far so good? All right. All right. So um, you can trim some of the fat or you can leave it. It's completely up to you. Uh, most of the prime ribs we get. Now, um, a little note also about our HB meat markets. Um, we have some of the hardest working men and women working in those HB meat markets. And they are fantastic at what they do. And they're also a wealth and a plethora, plethora of knowledge. So if you find yourself going, hey, I need this size for this many people, or can you help me with this? They'll be happy to help pick out the right size for you. We've got some, I think, some, uh, some tips that are going to go up as well. They'll be happy to show you how to do it and then uh, kind of take you through the whole process. But it is really, really simple. And we're going to show you exactly how to do it right now. So it starts with this beautiful prime rib. This is a, uh, a four rib. I don't know if you can kind of see this. I'm going to pick this guy up. So there are four ribs. This is a big, it's a big guy. This is about a nine and a half, almost 10 pounds. Now you can go up to six, depending on how many people you have. That's a, just imagine another, you know, two inches on each side, basically with the bone. So the fact there's a bone in here lends itself to the roasting. Now, again, you could cut the bone off and just do this as a boneless roast, which we could, but we're doing the full prime rib roast. So I'll put some, some gloves on first, because I'm going to show you how to season it. 
Typically, we have a um, great question. I'm sorry to interrupt. So yes, no, um, if you were to go to the meat market, yes. um, what would you ask for specifically? So standing rib roast. Now it's a great okay. question. And who asked the question? Um, Joe, 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 Joe. Mm -hmm. So Joe, um, there are a lot of times during the holidays, a lot of HEBs will pre cut, pre wrap and pre truss prime ribs, and it can be anywhere from two to four bones. I know I've seen them at certain ones. Not, a free, not every HEB I think does that, but there are a lot of them that do, so they're actually pre-gifted and ready to go. So basically all you gotta do is find the one that's the right size for you and you can go from there. Um, they do that, not all of them have that, but there are a lot of them that will do that, kind of pre in preempt for the holidays to kind of get you ready to go so it's easier. Um, if this were, we were gonna cut this into steaks, and this is a big piece of meat, <laughs> this thing is awesome. Uh, if I were to cut this into about one inch steaks, you would have a beautiful ribeye. Now I could keep the bone on this and I would season it really, really liberally on both sides for a nice, like that'd be your perfect steakhouse experience. So you'd want to season it liberally on both sides because the thicker the piece of meat, the more salt and pepper you want to do. So don't be um, scared or don't be, uh, don't be afraid to season it well. What's the word I'm looking for? Go crazy. Generously seasoned. Like generously generously seasoned. We'll go with generously. Uh, generously season this because look at how thick this is. So the seasoning we put all around this, we're gonna coat this thing in seasoning, I'll show you. You want this to be completely coated so that as it's slowly cooking, and we're not gonna do, I'm gonna show you another easy trick on how to roast it. We want all that salt and all that flavor to really penetrate the meat. And if we just do a really light dusting, a lot of that, when this fat starts to render and starts to fall off, some of that seasoning may go with it. So we wanna really make sure we pack it on there. So to start, our seasoning is a little bit of fresh herbs. So if you follow the recipe, it's a little rosemary and fresh thyme we've chopped in there. And I'm gonna use our, uh, so those of you that have a cooking connection uh, near you, if you have a cooking connection HEB, that's a cooking connection kitchen, that's where these products come from is gonna complete our holiday prime ribs. So I've got some uh, fantastic Fisher & Weezer products. So Fisher & Weezer, local company, Adams Reserve, also Adams Spices in Gonzales, Texas, also local, two great local companies. So we're gonna finish our finished prime rib with the onion blossom horseradish. There's also another great horseradish that I wanted to mention that Fisher & Weezer also carries in your local cooking connection, toasted garlic horseradish dip. So I think the horseradish, and Chef, correct me if I'm wrong, it's very classic to like a nice big, like cote de bouffe or like a really nice yes. prime rib like this. Like you want a little bit of that, a little spiciness, a little richness, some nice it's garlic flavor. It's very traditional flavor. to see a horseradish cream sauce served with like... Very classic. A, yeah, like at a carving station or something like that. There you go. Um, I have a great question um, from one of our viewers. They had a question about um, how much meat per person. So funny you would ask, we just talked about this. So this is about a nine pound prime rib. So the bone obviously is gonna weigh something as well, right? There's the bone weight in there, which we're not gonna eat the bone. You can chew on it, but I guess you can't really eat it. <laughs> so uh, I, we typically do about a pound per person. The reason why I say that, and Charlotte is a, uh, is a nutritionist, so she can actually, she's gonna, I want her to talk on it as well. But typically I say about a pound per person because once this cooks, you're gonna have a lot of fat and weight rendering out of it, and it's going to shrink up a little bit. So you're gonna get a lot of loss when you cook it. Not a ton of loss, but I would say you're gonna get some loss. So out of this, I would say seven, eight people. That's if they're not huge eaters. I know people that can go to a steakhouse and eat a 42 ounce porterhouse and be like, can I have my baked potato on the side as well? Like, so I mean, like it depends on how big of eaters you are. Typically for this though, you can probably, instead of doing the one inch thick cut of of prime rib, you'd probably slice it in half. You do maybe quarter inch to half an inch is probably what you'd serve people. So you can probably get a little more out of it. If you have leftovers, one of the best things to do with this cut of beef is refrigerate it, let it set up. And then you can literally thinly slice in the morning or whenever you're doing it, throw it with your eggs, saute it, or just throw it on a sandwich with some bread, a little avocado, some I like bread. it like cold with a piece of yeah, bread. Yeah, just like really well seasoned, just Dip really simple. So radish. yeah, so about a pound per person. But Charlotte, okay. talk about your, because we were talking about this, so tell them what your Well, your I mean, typically on. four to six ounces is a serving of meat, but That's a, this is a, a Texas-sized <laughs> serving and it's the holidays, so. It's a little difference in a Texas-sized serving I, versus well, a regular. Yeah, when I, buy, um, when I buy a roast or any sort of big piece of beef, I usually yeah. think eight ounces. We'll go, with, we'll go with that. So Raw there you go. Weight, yeah. So as thick as you want to do it, but that's, that's usually about the rule. So about a pound, eight ounces a person. So I'm going to use our, our rub. So our Adam's Reserve rub is a rib roast and steak. So, okay, Scott, I'm going to answer a question for you. Yes, Scott, I've got a question. Go ahead, Scott. I'm, I'm listening. So <laughs> what if I don't have 
a cooking connection that has this rub. What if I can't find this rub? That's a great question, Scott. I'm glad you asked. So instead, this rib roast and steak rub has a little bit of smoke flavoring. It has a little bit of molasses. It has a little bit of sugar. And that's just going to kind of create a crust on there. If I were doing this sans a rub, salt, pepper, garlic powder is literally all you need because the temperature we're going to cook this at is going to be nice and low for a good amount of time. So you'll still get a good crust and caramelization. But if you do have a cooking connection, this just has kind of all that stuff built into it. And so it's, uh, it's just, it, and it's a lot easier than just trying to, you know, make up a, a rub on your own. So uh, typically there's salt in this rub. So I would let it sit with my fresh herbs. I chop my fresh herbs. Normally I would let that sit for at least 30 minutes. But if I let it sit for 30 minutes, I'll run out of jokes and then we'll be, you know, long on time. So we're going to let this uh, just sit for a second, then I'm going to rub it down. Um, the salt and the herbs, the longer that sits, the more the salt is going to pull out some of those essential oils from the actual herbs, which will give you that. So you'll get more of that even thyme and rosemary flavor kind of permeating throughout the rub. That's why on the recipe it calls to just let it sit for a little while. Now, you can also make this rub overnight and let it sit out or just cover it and then let that, that'll just pull out and leach out of those flavors. We've probably done, I know I say this a lot, probably a million of these different catering events. And we do flavored salts all the time. And typically we'll make them on a Friday. We'll come back at the events on a Monday, Tuesday, whether it's uh, roasted pepper or not roasted peppers, like dried peppers, lemon salt, lemon zest, lime zest, or a Blanco zest, any kind of citrus zest. You let it sit and the longer that salt, the salt will just draw out all those oils and stuff and it just permeates it throughout. So you can do the same thing with herbs. So we're gonna have to sit for a second. All right, I'm not gonna season it on here because it's gonna make a giant mess. I'm gonna get our roasting pan for this, which I have over here. And uh, where did I get this roasting pan and rack? Good question, Charlotte, H-E-B. It's our K&T roasting pan, that copper roasting pan. I'm gonna take off one of my gloves here. So about a third of a cup. So when I say liberal, this is, there's a little note that says, or as needed. So this is where it's, or as needed. So I'm gonna hit this on top. Now, if you wanted to, I don't think you need to, but if you wanted to, that was a very generous amount. You could kind of poke little holes in this if you wanted it. Some people will kind of hide garlic cloves or if they want it to penetrate. But honestly, since there is salt in the rub, there's a little bit of sugar. There is, it is gonna do a little bit of kind of like dry brining, a little osmosis. It'll kind of pull some of that out and just kind of leak into the skin here. So I don't think you need to poke holes in it. Plus with this kind of meat, as expensive as it is, I don't want you to poke a bunch of holes in it because then when it's roasting, all that beautiful juice and everything will just kind of run out. My mom used to do that. She'd poke holes and then yeah. shove garlic in it's it. It's kind of old. Yeah, it's totally old school to do like a little garlic, uh, you know, like just kind of stud the uh, roast with garlic. All right, so see, I have a lot of roast here. I'm just going to keep picking it up. And you're and not putting any to, oil on it, Chef? No oil? Uh, uh, yes. Normally you would do oil, but just because um, I'm just trying to stay less oily. <laughs> I skipped that part. <laughs> yes, it calls for about a quarter cup of olive oil, and that's basically just to get it to stick, but I'm also okay. going to show you that uh, this is a, uh, I'm trying to, to go through less gloves, so yes, a little suspension of disbelief here. I, got I also want to say uh, to, to those of you that have been to every class, we really appreciate you sticking with us in all this. Um, you know, we are, we are not a professional production studio. Uh, we are literally here live in our test kitchens on a weekly basis uh, doing these classes. And so we, we appreciate your, uh, your grace and mercy as we <laughs> navigate our way through some of the, the pitfalls of what normally happens with technology. So we really appreciate, I really appreciate you, number one, giving the time, and number two, uh, sticking with us through all the, uh, the ups and downs as we uh, you know, try to make we these videos happen. A really good question from Sab um, Sabrina. She asked, how far in advance can we purchase um, the meat for Christmas dinner? So we have, we're 10 days out, so what would you out. suggest? So I feel like once they start to cut it and take it out of the cryovac bag, you, the, t the clock starts ticking on the freshness of it. So for these, like as beautiful as these are, I would say two to three days. Two to three days is probably what, what I would do. Okay. Um, you could probably stretch them a little bit further than that. I think you're, uh, you mean market parchment would probably say you could probably stretch it maybe three to four, you know, three to four days. Um, but just for me, I want to keep it nice and fresh. So I'm going to say, I'll say for me, I would say, no more than like three to four days, I would okay. say max, just beforehand, because you don't want it to start, you know, we'll start changing color or whatever, and I want it to be nice and fresh for you. Okay, so this is completely rubbed down. If there's any spots that miss, just add a little more. All right, I'm going to put our rack back in here. Look at that rack. So why do they call it a standing rib roast? Because it's got the ribs and it stands up on its own. What? I know, that kind of blew my mind when you realize how simple things are when they call them what they are. Standing rib roast, stands on the ribs and gets roasted. Okay, so... Thermometer. Now, how do I check this? So normally if we were grilling on a, on a hot grill, if I just have one of these, you know, thick cut two inch or one inch ribeye steaks, 
I could kind of feel for doneness. Well, you can't really feel for doneness on this because there's a lot of fat, obviously, in a ribeye. And on the, the top where it is, you could also get some bones. So it's a little different. You can't just do the field test. So we're going to use a thermometer. So what kind of thermometer is best to use for one of these? The fact that you bought, if you are buying a prime rib, the fact that you're spending the money on the prime rib, I would encourage you to buy a thermometer. And the kind of thermometer depends on you. But this is what I'm going to show you what I like to do. Because you don't want to poke a bunch of holes, which I'm going to show you a couple. So all the thermometers that I have up here are all, and you can see from that camera, all bought at HEB. You can buy much local HEB. These are totally fine. Nothing wrong with these. These little stick thermometers where you can stick it in and let it sit, and then it'll eventually tell you. These are fine. My problem is on one of these, I want to, a, I want to put my probe at the end, and I want to be able to see it, and I don't want to kind of keep turning it. You could put it up top, but the problem with this is you could also hit a bone, and you don't want to get a false reading, or if it's too close to a bone or not near, then you could get, it's kind of off. So I don't like to do this um, just for that. It's great for turkeys and whatever when it's just going to sit. For these kind of thermometers, these are also great. These are like instant read. But you don't want to have to pull this out every 30 minutes and keep poking holes in your roast and watching all that beautiful juice run everywhere. So I avoid those as well. I like to use the, uh, the good old probe thermometer. So this comes with an oven safe coil. And most of them do. Any of the most of the probe thermometers are meant to put inside the meat, leave the coil in, put the, uh, they have usually a magnetic strip, and they'll just hang on the side. And that way, you set the timer or the temp for what temperature you want your roast to be internally and then you let it go. And that way you walk away. So if I start having a glass of wine, one glass turns into 17 glasses or whatever it is, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened to the roast? Where, what, what did I do? Well, you have insurance because this guy is gonna tell you, the instant read will tell you, hey, it's 135, you asked for 135, the alarm's going Safety. off, and you go, oh great. Safety. So, and that way you're not like, if you have one of these and that's all, and that's all you got, hey, no, no big deal, you can totally do it that way. Just give it more time than you think you need because the fact there's a bone in this, it will take longer to roast. Um, and the, what we're also going to do for insurance is, it happens every year where somebody does like the turkey where they say, hey, blast the heat to like 500 degrees and get that nice caramelization and turn the heat down. So great. We do that. I follow those instructions and all of a sudden, 20 minutes later, I'm like, did the timer go off? I smell something burning. Do you know? It's like, it's like, that's like, whoops. Like now this prime rib is completely like, it could be jerky now from then on. So, or it could be so caramelized that you're like, I can't, you can't bring it back. So. I always start at 325 and I leave it at 325. That's what this holiday is. It's literally throw it in there. It's seasoned, the probe thermometer, which I'll show you. I have my old Bessie. This has also gotten at HEB. This is an old one here. I just put you new batteries in it, brought her back to life. Hey, Scott, I have, really quickly, I have a great yeah. question over here. Someone asked how, um, when you should put the rub on um, the roast and how long you should. Um, Put the rub on before you actually roast excellent question if at all possible i would let this roast sit in the seasoning overnight over 24 hours like in the, the longer you let it sit the, in the refrigerator okay. the longer you let it sit the more flavor it will pull in it'll do that kind of thing same thing with like turkey it'll just kind of dry brine it all that all that great stuff will just kind of it'll those it'll pull everything out and just kind of lock everything back in so the longer you can let it sit the better it is um, the one I did today was not, it did not sit overnight, it sat early. We had to do a little TV magic because of the fact that this will take, you know, could take four to five hours to cook, so we want to make sure we had one done for you guys. So all I'm going to do on my instant read, this is an old school instant read, I'm going to set it for 135. Now, a word about doneness. So the, uh, the doneness of a steak, what the inter internal temperature is. Some people like it black and blue, some people like it well done, some people like it. The great thing about prime rib is you can really kind of, if somebody likes it a little more rare, you can set your internal thermometer for about 135 or 130 if you want a little more than that or a little less than that. You'd stick it in your, your meat and then that way by the time the center is at 135, the perfect temperature for whatever you wanted, the outside pieces will be a little more done. So as it goes out, it's gonna get, cause these are closer to the edge, they'll get a little more done. So the piece on the end will be a little more. If you have like an uncle or an aunt or mom or dad or whatever that once they just burned, the way I do it is cook your roast the way the majority of people are gonna want it and then take that piece, slice it off Throw it in a hot pan for 30 seconds, sear it on both sides, you're good to go. Okay, I have a couple of great questions. Yes. One question from Giovanna is, would you cover the roast before you put it in the oven? You um, can. Okay. I don't. I just you leave don't, it out. You just let it go? No, I'm just going to let it go because we're doing it at 325. Okay. Yep, so that way it's going to slowly kind of caramelize. I'm not going at a super high temperature to where it's just going to be. I want that really nice crust that this fat cap is going to give me. Okay. And so that 325 is just... We're just letting it go and it'll just kind of, and you'll see when I pull this one out, it just has that beautiful kind of crusty fat over the top. Okay. And then so, 
Yeah, go ahead. One Sorry. more question. So yep. you said 135, and where is that on our scale of the done scale? Done so 135. Oh man, if you Google it, it's like 135 will tell you that's either medium. It's a little. It's medium between well, medium rare and it's between and medium. medium well yeah. and medium. I'd say I'd say 135 is like going more to like almost a like to medium, just to yeah. medium yeah. than it is like medium rare. But like 130 would be on that like cusp. But yeah, if you Google it, Omaha Steaks has their own you know, version of like, yeah. it, it's all between like five and six degrees of each other. So the probe thermometer, I'm gonna put in the, find the dead center of it. And if you have a fatter side and a smaller side, use the fatter side. Probe thermometer goes right in side as, as evenly as you can, right inside the meat. And I'm gonna back it out and just make sure I get it right inside there. So there you go. So that's all the way in with the probe thermometer. And then literally, so the internal temperature of my meat right now is showing as 49 degrees. So this whole thing, gets put in the oven, and then I don't have to worry about anything. I have to worry about, oh my God, did I turn the, did I turn the oven off? Did I, where's my, what's my temperature? Did I go check it? Anybody check the roast? It's just in and done. Again, 325 on this oven. The cord, the fact that I've got it, wait for it. What? I walk away. Somebody hands me a glass of Cabernet. Like, that's hanging out. That's good. All right. So while that goes, we are going to turn our attention to uh, starting our mashed potatoes. So we're going to go starting our mashed potatoes, and then we're going to flip and pivot to our uh, roasted fennel and get that whole thing going. We're going to start with the potatoes. So first, potatoes. So French style mashed potatoes. So I had the pleasure of going uh, to uh, Vegas to stage at a uh, three-star Michelin restaurant called Joe Rubichon, who's a very famous French chef. Um, and they, the classic way they do the French potatoes is a, the way he used to do them was a 50% potato to 50% butter and cream, which is a that's a half and half ratio. That's a lot of fat in those potatoes. The great thing about the potato you can use though, they will absorb an incredible amount of butter and cream when you emulsify them the right way. So we're not gonna go quite that far because those are the kind of potatoes, like when you take a bite of it, it can just slide right out of your mouth because there's so much fat on it, but they're good. Um, so I've gone ahead and diced up my potatoes. So I diced mine small. Now what the, a word about potatoes. So I'm gonna use a Yukon Gold or you can use any kind of white potato. Yukon Gold falls in that family. Um, you just want smooth, uh, relatively the same size. Uh, the, the, smaller you cook, the smaller you cut it, the faster it cooks. So I went, so in order to be able to do this quickly, I cut them in a pretty small dice, and I'm gonna throw them in water, and I'm gonna bring them up to a, about a simmer, and I'm just gonna let them cook until they're nice and tender, and then I'm gonna drain them, we're gonna let them steam for a second, and we're gonna make a tea. Why are we gonna make a tea? Well, it's not the tea in the, in the typical sense you're thinking. We're gonna make a tea that is gonna steep flavor into our cream, so I'm gonna use a lot of cream and a little bit of butter. Now I have a lot of butter over here. I have about a pound of butter over here. And I want to show you as we do it, I'm, you're going to watch me. Did you just say a pound of butter? I have a pound of butter. I won't use all of it. The recipe calls for four ounces of butter. But this is where I went, that's basic. So we're going to do, I'm going to show you, you can add more butter always. So the cream, we're going to infuse a flavor. So like uh, we do the French mashed potato, let me go over here first. I'm going to switch cameras a lot as I go. We're gonna be doing a lot of cooking at the stove and a lot of back and forth, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm switching back and forth. I'm gonna give our camera guys uh, enough time to do it. So the potatoes are gonna go in. That's a lot of water, hang on. Let me dump some water out. Da, 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 so while you're da, da, doing da, da. that, um, what is your favorite wine to drink with this roast? What is my favorite wine? What's your favorite wine? grape, chef? What's your favorite? My favorite grape, you know what? Uh, it really varies. So I, uh, Used to really like Syrahs, Pinots. Um, I think everybody liked Merlot until the movie Sideways came out and everybody also got scared <laughs> to drink Merlot. <laughs> well, then everyone I, started I drinking Pinot Noir. I like Merlot. So. Um, okay, real quick note. Uh, we're adding cold water and I am gonna salt the potatoes. I know that maybe that a lot of times they said it was a no-no. Um, when I went to culinary school, they said you never salt the potato water that you're doing it. Well, it depends on the potato. So like I said, the waxy, we're using a, a medium, kind of a medium grain potato. So it's a medium wax, medium starch. So it's kind of across the board, like russet potatoes tend to be high in starch, low in sugar, low in moisture. Red potatoes, new potatoes tend to be uh, really high in, uh, high or low in starch and really high in sugar and moisture. And so that makes a difference in your final uh, mash, the creaminess of it. So russet is a completely acceptable to potato to use. It'll get, it'll, it'll cream, it does very well with whipped. There's just something about the Yukon Gold that just, it just has a little more, it's a little nuttier, it's a little butterier, and with all the stuff we're gonna add, it just works a little better. So, all right, so while those are cooking, while that's getting going, I'm gonna get it on high, I'm gonna bring that up to a boil. So we're gonna make the tea. So what in the heck is the tea for? So 
In a beautiful French style mashed potato, you don't have all the big chump, chunks and lumps and everything else. You're going to get a potato ricer. Well, guess what? I went to HEB to try and find a potato ricer and I couldn't find a potato ricer. So guess what? We're going to do this old school. I'm going to show you how to do it without a potato ricer. And if you happen to come across a potato ricer, you can use a ricer, which will give you that really beautiful vinyl texture. Now, if you have one of those old school mashers, you can totally use that. But the whole purpose of these potatoes is you will have this beautifully creamy whipped potato that has so much flavor infused in it and so much butter and cream that it's just unbelievable. So if you so, don't have... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry just, to interrupt. I'm using a cheap sieve. Hey. That's how we're going to do it. It's a, it's, it Old has school. a purpose, but I have a great exactly question. Right. So yes, Charlotte Mitchell had a question regarding, yes. um, do you always peel the potatoes? I do. Now, if you have a ricer, you don't have to. Okay. Because a ricer or a food mill, you can also use that, will actually stop the skins from going in, which is a great tool to have. But if you don't, I just do anyway because okay. it's, the reason being I like to peel them is because when you go to check for doneness, sometimes the skin, depending on the thickness, especially if you're using a russet, the russets have thick skin, you may think that it's not quite done because the skin is thicker, it may have a little more give, and the potato inside is totally ready to come out. So I like to just peel them so that way there's no... There's so no, the, like, the typical French potato, mashed potato, d peeled. is peeled though, correct? Yeah, and a lot of times they'll blanch the potatoes in water. Like they'll just take these whole and put them in water and then they'll do it and then they peel them when they're cooked and then oh. they'll mash them. Okay. That just seems like a lot and of And I've got work. one more question for yes. you um, about the mashing of the potato. Um, Giovanna asks, can you mash in the saucepan itself? She says that sometimes she's scared of scraping the sides of her yeah. cookware. You can. Um, I, if you're using like a nonstick pan, like something like this, I'm not going to scrape in that one. Um, these are PFOA free. These are the great kitchen and table HEB pans that are really awesome. Um, but I, I do it in a bowl okay. and then I'll add it back to the pot. Cause I like the way I'll, I'll show you how we're going to do it, but I'm going to whip it in a bowl and I'm going to add butter slowly. So instead of melting the butter with the cream, butter goes in at the last second and it gets folded in and then you're just going to get this whipped airy. So it starts with three cups of heavy whipping cream. Why three cups? You may not need all three cups because I don't know if you know this, but every pound of potatoes that you get out of a bag is not always the exact poundage on the label. That just is the way it goes because every potato is different size, different weight. So typically it's a, it's a usually a, you know, if you get three pounds of potatoes, it's hopefully three pounds of potatoes, but you could have some loss in there. When you go to peel it, if it's dark, you throw that one away. Now you're down three, three pounds of potatoes. So, you know, we kind of, we'll, we'll do it as a, basic measure. We're going to try and stick with three pounds. So if you don't end up using all the cream, you don't have to use it all. We just want it there as you emulsify. We want to add it as we need it to the consistency that you want. And I'll show you what the consistency should look like. So going into this, we have a lot of stuff going into this. So I'm going to do shallots, peppercorns, bay leaves, garlic. So again, we're going to make a tea. So I'm just going to add some bay leaves. All this is going to get strained out, but I don't want to have any like weird stuff in our in our potato you just want it to be this beautiful creamy like yellow or white potato that's just perfect and ready to go so all this stuff is going to infuse the cream with flavor so i got shallots i've got some crushed garlic now the longer this cooks the more the garlic flavor is going to cook out we are adding raw garlic if you wanted to add if you've got some beautiful roasted garlic that you've done you can absolutely add that to it as well. I did peppercorns, I did bay leaves, I've got the garlic, I've got everything else, we're good. And when we season the cream, you wanna over season the cream. Just because I have it here, I'm gonna throw a little rosemary in my potatoes as well. If you wanna throw, you got a great garden of herbs outside, you got some lemon thyme, you got some regular thyme, feel free to use those as well. That's not in the recipe. What is in my recipe is nutmeg, but I don't have fresh nutmeg, so I'm not gonna use the dried because I like fresh, the flavor of it, so we're gonna leave that out. I'm gonna season the cream I'm going to almost over season the cream because I want the cream to be the salt that the potato gets, if that makes sense. So I'm going to add the, uh, I'm going to put this on the stove. I'm going to turn up the heat. Now, if you've ever made, uh, tried making hot chocolate and you've put like milk on the stove and you've walked away to go grab whatever's going on, you come back and it's like all over the place and milk scalds and milk is nasty when it burns into your stove. Uh, I always do it over low heat and just kind of watch it. Um, never turn your back on the, uh, on the cream because it, uh, it will get you. I'm going to kind of turn this up. I'm going to be a little bit more adventurous. Uh, Charlotte, keep your eyes on that if you see I it. have a kind really a interesting line. question. Janessa asked if you, would, if you could substitute with a non-dairy option and how that might affect the flavor. You can, I've got I a think brilliant you can. question. Yeah, I think it's a great question, Jessica. You, you can. Um, 
it may affect the fine, like if you were to like, so I'm, I'm assuming like if you're trying to do a vegan thing, like if you were to do oat milk or soy milk or something like that, or soy, uh, soy sour cream or something like that, like one of those kind of like tofu sour creams, you can, I don't know, you can definitely use the fake butter. There's a lot of really good vegetable based butters that yeah. are, taste just as good. I'm using European butter, which is like an 83 to 85% butter yep. fat because it's churned longer. It's creamier, it melts easier, and it's just really, really flavorful. Um, but you could absolutely, I would say, just try it and see what happens. We've done a lot of, we've done a lot of vegan different. I mean, you can totally use some good. The uh, I would probably use stock in like a vegetable stock you instead could use of cream. Stock as and well, then, yeah. Um, do but you could add like one of those the vegan butter. You can do. Yeah. Yeah, you can do stock. You can do. I thought you it was do a the great same thing with your because I've never thought could, about French style like Robuchon potatoes without actual cream without and having butter. the, I think the, that's the brilliant. fifty yeah. percent butter in there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it's a great thing, and you could do the same exact thing if you're going to use soy milk, oat milk, whatever it is. Yeah. Just add that to the pan. You can still flavor it all the same ways, and you can still do the same thing. So I'd say try it, and then send us a picture and like tag us on the Insta Instagrams. Okay, so that's all going. I'm going to watch that. So now the uh, the fennel. I have an issue with fennel, in that I love fennel. It's one of my favorite vegetables. Um, if you come to my house for Thanksgiving my turkey is roasted on a bed of fennel, I would say the fennel stalks and the fennel fronds. Um, so the anatomy of fennel is kind of, it's cool. I know uh, most people probably see it at HEB and they merchandise it really pretty at most HEBs. They'll have it kind of sitting up or they'll have it like this. And so I think for most people, as you're looking at it, it looks like, is that a, is it daikon? Is it like, is it just some, just some root vegetables? Is it, is it bok choy? Whatever it is, you may not realize it. But fennel is actually one of the best vegetables to roast and has so much good flavor. So like celery, it has like these stalks. And so if I just tear one off, I don't know if you can kind of see, but there's like, you can see there's like a rib that it looks like, except for the leaves, it has a celery look to it. So it has like the same ribbing and everything on it. So it has that same, so it, it's, it's similar to it. So I use it the exact same way. So typical mirepoix, which is the French word for that, like the carrot, celery, and onion. I love to add the fennel to that as well. I'm going to use a, uh, my little tiny baby knife here. So I'm going to cut the tops off. I'm going to show you how to cut, cut this. Cut the tops off. So these are what I would set aside. Now these can be used to make stock. They can be used to uh, flavor. I could throw these compost, in our they, cream they mixture. Compost, they could be used to make compost. It could also be used to make compost. Um, <laughs> I would encourage you to save the fennel fronds. They're delicious and they're great on salad. You can pull these off and it has like a, everybody thinks that, that the, because the way we have it labeled as anise, it has this like crazy like black licorice flavor. It's not as bad as you would think. Very it's not mild. like a nice extract. It's very subtle. And when you eat these, uh, I feel like the fennel fronds, if I had to describe it in a word, it's like there's a little small back note of like that bare licorice, but it's not like a harsh licorice. And then it's like a little bit of dill, a little bit of grass. So it's a really nice thing. It's a great addition to salads. It's really pretty. It's really, fluff it's really fluffy. So I would save that. But for right now, I don't need them. Ooh, so Charlotte gonna... Mitchell likes to put fennel on eggs. Fennel on like the yeah. like fennel pollen or fennel just like straight up like she this just little said fennel, fennel, so I'm assuming fennel fronds. I like it. Fennel fronds on eggs is a great way to do it. And it's also beautiful. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over here. You'll see our little camera, this little our little cream mixture is kind of coming to a bubble. All right, I'm gonna switch to a chef knife because this is not a what if my chef knife? Here it is. All right. Am I using a six hundred dollar chef knife? No, I'm not. I'm using this little nine dollar Dexter. That's all you need to do to get the job done. It's nice to have nice sharp knives in the kitchen. Uh, true story, sharp knives hurt less when you cut yourself because when you have a really dull knife and you're really pressing and you go down, you're going to get the full force of that where with a sharp knife, they make cleaner cuts so they're easier to heal. True story. Take it from me. All right. So I just trimmed the bottom. I, I kind of did that fast. I apologize. I get going here. So I just trimmed the bottom off, not too much because I want the bulb to kind of stay intact. So I just kind of trimmed the top, trimmed the bottom and I'm going to pull off. Now you could, if you don't want to waste this. You could always take it like a carrot peeler and just peel the outside of all the brown off. I don't mind just taking this off so it exposes a little smaller bulb and just throw this away or compost it. Um, and I'm gonna chop it because I want it to look pretty. You can do this a million different ways. I like to go top to bottom. So as you can see here, let's see if you can see it. Just top to bottom, these beautiful little, so you get the kind of whole thing together here. And that way when I'm serving it, so I get those little so the root's still intact, so I have that whole piece. And once this roasts, it's like a nice little piece that kind of, it just stays in the fork better. It kind of melts a little better. It sears a little better. So that's how I'm going to do those. I'm going to get a bowl over here. That's my bowl for my potatoes. 
as I'm leaning here. Is everything making sense so far? I want to make sure I didn't lose anybody or if everything's making sense. If it all's, whoa, see what happened? Oh, Samuel, oh, Samuel. Oh, bro, I what totally. Happened? See, Samuel, I blame Samuel, that's all right, watch this. I'm gonna take full responsibility for that. I was reading this great question and I got excited and that's I was right. actually just, really I'm enjoying. I'm totally teasing you. I think I'm gonna check our potatoes though. I'm gonna, the cream is gonna go up, that's all right. We have, uh, luckily we're not at our house where uh, this would take a long time to clean up. Good thing is we have these great cast iron burners, so I just burn all this stuff off. Later. I have a great question. Yes. Um, to totally deflect from my lack of. No, it's my fault. <laughs> Julie Lennox wants to know what a great alternative for fennel if you have someone who doesn't like fennel. Doesn't like fennel? I am not necessarily in the fennel camp, so I'm curious. I, uh, so Julie, are you familiar with sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes or? celery ac or celery root right around this time of year you can get those plentiful and those are delicious the same way celery root you just peel it's the root of celery and it has a really beautiful flavor and you can cut them kind of almost the same way just a big bulb and you would just peel everything off and you can dice it or slice it and roast it it just tastes like a little bit more just imagine like a really concentrated piece of celery that's what celery root is i also love the uh, uh sunchokes which are a little hard to find but sunchokes are also great the juice tomato chokes are fantastic um, it's, they just, they're a little more hardy and stand up to things. Um, I mean, you could do, I mean, I love, if you're looking for like hardy, like good kale, good hard kale, you could roast too. Roasted kale is actually one of my favorite things. It gets really crispy. It gets really nice and has a really nutty flavor. That's in that, uh, Charlotte knows this, uh, cruciferous family, which all those cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, all that stuff, when you burn them, there's something about the sugar in those that just the flavor's like, out of, everybody's had like, you've been to a restaurant where you've had fried Brussels sprouts. Like back, you know, when mom used to make them in the 50s and 60s, like they would boil them for 16 hours and they'd be like, no wonder everybody hated Brussels sprouts. Um, you take anything and boil it for 15 hours in it and it's gonna taste terrible. Um, that chard bitter and bitter goes really well together. Yeah, a little bitter, it's good. Red yeah. char I love red chard. Red chard uh, is just the, uh, it's the, in the beet family that just doesn't have the, the bulb, the tuber, is that right? Tuber, is the right word there? Somebody better fact check that. Um, all right, I'm peeling more fennel here. Uh, just gonna chop it here. Um, I love, I, I wish you could find celery root every, uh, everywhere, uh, all year round, but you can't. Um, so I, when it comes into season, which is now, I love to take advantage of that and pomegranates. I know pomegranates are mostly, you know, you're able to get them year round, but as far as winter goes, this is a great time to, to take advantage of some of those. And you can find all that stuff at HEB. Again, just taking the root off, just gonna cut this up. Now I've gone ahead and cooked my bacon because I figured I didn't know how this was going to go over there with all this great stuff. So I've gone ahead and sauteed our bacon. If you're looking at the recipe and you're going, what is the, what's the bacon we're using? The, uh, it's the, wait for it, the Pitmaster bacon. That's what it is. Well, good question. The Pitmaster bacon is actually a seasonal bacon. So you probably won't be able to find it at your local HEB. So instead, one of the best things I've found, one of my greatest finds I've been able to do is this, uh, this new H-E-B hickory smoked dry cured center cut. Look at how adorable that little center cut piece of bacon is. Dice it up, ready to go for anything you <laughs> want to use. Crispy, super fun. And they're great. And they don't take up a lot of room in your fridge, which is kind of a big thing when you look at uh, you know, where things need to go. Uh, their fridge. Okay, this is going to get, uh, I'm going to do a little, little olive oil. And I'm going to get a hot pan together. I'm going to put a little olive oil in my hot pan here. And I'm gonna sear this. So now in a cast iron pan, the recipe would tell you to cook off your bacon. We're gonna drain it with a slotted spoon. We're gonna leave that bacon fat in the pan. But since you're not here to smell it, I won't tease you with it. I'll just have already made the crumble. Uh, we would sear off a little bit of our, we'd add our fennel to the pan. It would still be hot. It'd kind of start to caramelize and that goes into a hot oven and we'll let that roast. And when it all comes out, that, car that beautiful caramelized Fennel is all ready to go, and then we just add our bacon and rosemary crumb to the top, and I'll show you how to do that once we sear off our... My cream's still good. It just needed one, it just had one, one tantrum. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to let itself, let us know. We weren't paying attention to it. I'm so sorry. It's really, I mean, if I'm the one cooking, Charlotte, it's really not your fault. It's more the cook's fault, right? You know what they say? I can't I really blame so somebody else. I was so fascinated watching you <laughs> cut that fennel. Oh, It was mesmerizing. Stop. All right, so I'm gonna check on our, uh, so I'm gonna, let me, let me toss this little salt and pepper. All I have is peppercorns, great. I'm also my own, uh, my own PA up here and food fetcher, and so if I don't have something, that's also on, on me. That's also how this works. 
seeing as we're not a, uh, you know. I'm um, chef behind you. You have a giant pepper. Oh, mill. you mean the big, the the the, the big daddy pepper mill? A gi giant. I'm gonna use it just because just it's fun. Just for to fun use. now, because come on. <laughs> This is where you stand way it's just, back. You could socially distance and pepper somebody's food. Yes. Season someone's food. I think this may actually be a mixture of white pepper and black pepper, which I'm all right with. All right, so our cream is going. We're gonna season this up with a giant Ooh, pepper Ooh, we have a, a great question about yes. seasoning. Blake has a question. Of, yes. Wants to know, why do chefs hate iodized salt? I love this question. I, and, and I have I, an answer for you. I am gonna let Salt Tompkins <laughs> answer this. So iodized salt, so great question. So uh, kosher salt is typically mined. It's very clean. Iodized salt can be a, it's, you know, can come from the same place, but usually they, they spray iodized salt with a, I don't really know what it is. They spray it with some chemicals, they spray it with the iodine and stuff, and it's just a, it's a harsher salt. Um, and that when you use it in something, if I were to make you two dishes, Blake, that had one with kosher salt, one with iodized salt, iodized salt just has a harsher salty flavor, and kosher salt tends to be very clean, so it'll let the flavors actually come through. Same thing with like your sea salts and things like that, but there's a lot of like, you get into like Hawaiian black salts, red salts, like all that stuff. Those are all minerally, like gray salt. There's a, there's a mineral character, so those aren't as clean. Those would be like finishing salts. Fleur de sel, also like Fleur de sel is a finishing salt. It's very, it's very creamy. It gives like a creamy kind of mixture and it kind of melts in. Uh, a lot of chefs love Malden salt. I like Malden salt when you want that crunch. It's my um, we actually sell Malden salt at HEB. It's a great salt. Um, that has, it's just, it's a bigger kind of texture. We also sell the smoked malden salt, which is chez magnifique. Um, those are also really good with that, but no, the malden salt is crunchy, but kosher salt and iodized salt. I always say in the recipes I write, if you're going to use iodized salt, use half the amount because it is a lot just saltier. Just, it's just a more salty. I hate iodized salt. I, 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 God love you if you use it. And I think it's great, but I just, there's something about iodized salt. I've just never, I've just had a, we've been enemies for a long time. I don't know why. All right. I'm going to sear this off. Ooh. Hot pan. Love that um, sound. But no, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, now, I don't typically want to get fire on this because fire is going to do that flame broil thing, and I don't want to have a flame broiled feeling on my fennel. But I do want to get a little caramelization in here, so we're going to give it a little toss. Iodized um, salt. Iodized salt is also a smaller granule, so if you're going to if you're Tends going to, be, to substitute um, like teaspoon for teaspoon, just know that iodized. You'll, have, you'll be adding a little more salt to your dish. Exactly. So you wonder why you always see chef's salt like this up high. The reason being is that if you salt down low, you, somebody's going to get a really concentrated piece of salt on whatever that is. So they salt high so it's dusted. So it makes it more even as you do it. And you can use less. Because kosher salt, again, is like those little crystals. And there's different kinds. I think my favorite kind of kosher salt is definitely diamond crystal. Um, you use that a lot in most of the restaurants in California that I've ever worked in. Um, I like Morton as a close second, but I love the, the diamond is a little bit smaller granule. I just, I don't know what it is about diamond. I, maybe it's the red box. I don't know. All right. So you can see in our little camera here. Oh, trick to learning how to flip things in a pan. If you want to be, if you want to want to do this pan flipping, uh, the best way to start doing that is with beans because beans are amazingly hard to keep in a pan if you flip them because they bounce everywhere. So if you master it with like a half a cup of beans Ooh. to start, you will get the trick and this will seem like easy peasy. All right, I'm gonna turn off so our wait, cream. Wait, Kimberly says you better toss some salt over your left shoulder. Why, did I spill salt? Yeah. Is she superstitious? I think so. What if I toss it over my right shoulder? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Is it worse? Or should I toss it over my left as well? Should I toss them over my head as well? I'm gonna toss them just behind. There just you behind. go. I wanna cover everything. We okay, got it all. Okay, great. Now when I slip later and I'll go, <laughs> I really did myself a good favor. All right, so I'm going to toss this together. All right, so while that's cooking, I'm going to turn this down a little bit. These pans, by the way, you can get at HEB. These, uh, these titanium, these are amazing. You know All what, right, Chef? So, so back to tossing, like doing the saute and the flip yeah. with your hand. Um, it's a push and a pull, but also start with toast or a piece of bread before you start with that. go to beans. Just because in case you, you know... You don't want to pick up a bunch of dried beans. Yeah, off they the did floor. that. They made us start on beans because if you could do beans, I mean, it's, I mean, literally in a shallow pan trying to catch beans is like good luck. It's like, what is this? So by the time you get to that, you'll be in good shape. Okay, so the uh, bacon and rosemary crumbs. So I've cooked off my bacon, like I said. I'm going to put them in our little cute food processor. I'll just use all the bacon. 
Why would I, why would I, why would I just use a little bit? Ooh, Blake says uh, you better have two scoops of uh, black eyed peas this year. Everyone is really concerned about your luck <laughs> right now, and these people really Can care I, about you. You know, <laughs> that may be the problem that I've, that I've gone through, <laughs> is that I've never, because I lived in California almost 15 years, nobody ever told me about black eyed peas. Why? I never knew that. So for years, I've never had black eyed peas, which probably says something about why uh, my luck is so bad. Maybe that's why. Don't ever take me to Vegas. I'm telling you, man. It'll be like, you, they walk in there and like the alarm goes off. All right, so I've got a couple pieces of potato. I'm going to just check them. So I'm going to push them with my knife, and they kind of mash, but there's a little bit of give. So I'm going to let it, it's like that one just shot out. So I'm going to let those go a little bit longer. They're almost there. It is possible to overcook the potatoes, and then when you put them in the mash, they'll get a little, they're just, you just don't want them waterlogged because they will get waterlogged. All right, a little rosemary. And so for the other part of the breadcrumb thing in this, I'm just going to eyeball this, just a little bit of rosemary. Uh, if you have dry rosemary, you can definitely use dry rosemary. I love the favor, the flavor, favor, favor, flavor, it's favor on this. I'd like to buy a vowel, please. The, uh, I love the flavor of fresh rosemary, and it grows wild almost everywhere. Just go to your neighbor's house and pick it. Don't tell them I said to do it, just go maybe ask. Um, so our, you can see our fennel over here. I'm going to keep flipping it. It's got nice and caramelized. I want to make sure I speed this up for you. So that goes in there, and I've got some uh, croutons. So normally, if you've got some sourdough bread laying around, you want to use that. You make bread. You want to throw it in there? You can. This is an easy way to do it. It's going to give extra flavor. I don't want to have to add a bunch of extra salt to that. So I just want the crumbs to really kind of carry it through. Let's see if I pack this too tight. Never. Um, if you're using fresh rosemary, fresh rosemary can be very, very fibrous. So when you're trying to chop it, you'll see what I mean. Sometimes um, I'm hesitant to use it um, in dishes because it's... Well, why? Why, Charlotte? Because I you do will hold Tell rosemary. Me. Because of what? Because it is really fibrous, but I think it is. putting it in the food processor like that is a really smart idea. So if you want to impress your friends, we sell two different kinds of rosemary at H-E-B. There's the, um, my favorite is what they call the silverback rosemary. So you'll notice that it's got the kind of the white back on the bottom, on the back of it. And then we sell another variety that I should have Googled the name of before I said that. But the silverback <laughs> is my favorite, and it's around. And that's the one you'll see a lot most of in the organic is a lot of the silverback. But those guys, uh, Patty's Herbs, who does our herbs, they are phenomenal. They are fantastic people. And literally, their, uh, their farms that they harvest all these great herbs that we get in on our shelves every day is about 30, 30 minutes from... Uh, you know what I just did? Did anybody please tell me what I did? Come on. That's right there. That's like, why is this working? What's going on? It's because the salt. It's the salt it's thing. It's telling me, thank you. See, Blake? See? <laughs> it all came full circle. All right. This is going to go off the heat. The, this is done. Check the cream. Charlotte gave me cream is good. I've let it go. Um, this is going to go into a bowl on the side. Here. I'm going to ditch this. I'm going to put in our rosemary crumbs. This is going to just hang out until that fennel comes out of the oven. So here we go. All right, you wanted me to use small one for mash, big one for the fennel. So here we go, in a nice gratin dish. Charlotte, where'd you get this dish? That white, that yeah, white casserole fancy. dish? She told me, as we were going through all this, just so you know, like we do our own food styling and our own uh, knees and all that stuff as we're kind of getting it, and we had a bunch of dishes that I picked out, and she was like, no, 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 you need to use the white one. And so I'm going to use the white one because it's... Thank Otherwise, I just thanks use for listening. Pyrex. <laughs> It's a it beautiful be like, kitchen and table, and I think it's so pretty. Kitchen and table, they do some great stuff. And All there's right. lots of different sides. So sizes. here we go. Sizes, excuse me, sizes. Our fennel's gonna go in the dish just like that. I'm gonna throw it in the oven. I got a really hot oven. Ooh, look at that steam. And I'm gonna let this guy go for a little while because I want him to kind of, I'm gonna do it on time. All right, we're getting close. All right, here we go. All right, this is where all the muscle comes in. This is where you're really gonna get your, uh, your muscle workout. So the potatoes, I'm gonna drain them because they're ready to go now. And again, that didn't take too long. I'm going to drop, I'm going to drip. You know, you can only hear my voice. Follow the sound of my voice. Now, if I had a food mill, we could make really quick time of this. But since I don't have a food mill, you're going to watch me do it the old fashioned way. All right, so I've got our drained potatoes here. I'm going to bring them over a bowl. I'm going to let those steam. And we're going to, we're going to make this together. So this is how this is going to work. This is why With I showed up today, grit. is for these pure potatoes. Grit. This is why I'm here. <laughs> All right, I have my chives. The only thing of color that's going to go on our potatoes is the chives, a little fresh onion in there, a little fresh aromatic herb uh, through the chives. I'm going to put some gloves on. So, so yes, ma'am. I've been holding on to this question for, for about 30 minutes. All right, tell me. Where is the nutmeg and why the nutmeg? So nutmeg is that, great question. 
Nutmeg is that little flavor in the potatoes that if it's missing, there's a nuance that you just don't get. And so I love adding a little bit of fret. Now, dried nutmeg, if you have it, you can totally use it. I believe that fresh nutmeg in the potatoes, like it just that one little thing where if you, you can try these and you'll be like, this, is, this tastes great without it. Like these, our crew, I made a, a pile of potatoes beforehand and they were like, it tastes great. There's no nutmeg in that. But if you add the nutmeg, it's that little thing that just takes it over the top. So don't have to have it, but I encourage you to do it. All right, here we go. Where's my big sieve? Here we go. All right, here's this is how it's going to work. I'm nervous because everybody's going to watch me. It's going to be like the whipped cream thing all over again. All right, I have a scoop here, a spoon. And as we go, this is exactly how you're going to do this if you don't have a food mill. Because this is what we'd be doing with our food mill. Normally, you'd put it in a food mill, and I would so easily just be able to go or smash it, and it's these beautiful pureed potatoes. So all you're going to do is just smash. You can see in the glass bowl here. Can you kind of see that? So I mean, I will these. wait a couple extra minutes <laughs> to watch you mash all these potatoes through that sieve By hand, so that I can three eat pounds. these potatoes. All right, so which is why I made mashed potatoes beforehand, by the way. Ooh, uh, Barbara says that in Germany, nutmeg was always used in mashed potatoes. I love go. that. See? It is. There's something about that, Barbara, right? Like you can, you can tell if you, if you made two sets of potatoes and I laid them side by side, with the same amount of cream, same amount of butter, same amount of salt, all that great stuff, you would definitely notice the one with nutmeg. You'd be like, what's that little, it's that little extra, that little extra punch. You see nutmeg in some um, macaroni and cheese recipes. Yep. Yeah, and the classic bechamel, usually like an yeah. Italian bechamel, usually will always have nutmeg in it. All right, so you can see how I did that. Uh-oh, that guy got over. And then we go. I'm gonna do this a little faster. Man. There's times in these classes where they're definitely challenging my, uh, my forearms in the, uh, in the way we do this. But that's how it works. See, we go through the same thing that you guys do. We go to the store and we're like, I just need that food mill. I know it's been here. It's here all the time. You know what, though? I think this is great because sometimes like, you don't necessarily have room for another kitchen gadget and you need to be resourceful. So I think... Having this, if you're, or what if your food mill breaks and you're like, great, I have the new family coming over. Newly married, new in-laws, new whatever it is, and you're like, I got no food mill, great. Christmas is ruined, or whatever. No, it doesn't have to be that dramatic, but you know. It's, easy, it's good to know there's always a shortcut with everything that we do here. All right, I'm just gonna keep working this in. This is good, I didn't go to the gym today, so this is a good, uh, this will just be an all forearm workout. So our prime rib is going while I'm mashing this in here. Do they want to see me mash all the mashed potatoes or can I, I just do, do a snapshot? I, come on, chef. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> it's only 622. All right, all right. Well, we're getting down to toward the end here. And so we're going we're gonna to basically kind of plate up everything. I'll show you the, uh, the prime rib that we've got and what it looks like once it comes out of the oven here. I love the, the fact that we had to do movie magic means that we had to uh, get in and do our, you know which one I actually like a little bit better? This is like a double sieve. This is kind of annoying. Let's do this. Let's pull this guy off. I'm going to go back to the small one. He's smaller. Oh, we have a question about yes. fresh nutmeg and where you can find it. Yes. Where is it located, Chef? Where can we find it? It's in the uh, spice aisle. Yes. So fresh nutmeg is actually not um, exactly fresh. It's just what you're referring to as Yes, whole, it's dried, yeah. Dried whole nutmeg. And so he's freshly, freshly grated whole. Dried whole nutmeg, yeah. correct. Because... Anytime you can use whole spices, do. Like if you can ever, like we sell a lot, of, we have a great spice selection at HEB. Um, now you may have to travel to different HEBs to find the right spice that you're looking for. Yeah. But you, uh, to, anytime you can take whole spices, cumin, coriander, peppercorns, whatever, and you toast them lightly and then you grind them, it is a absolute game changer. Anything, any, anytime you can ever use whole spices over the ground, it's always going to be fresher and just, it just tastes better. I Same have, thing with nutmeg. I have another question for you, and this is a really great question because there's going to be so much butter and so much cream in these potatoes. Yes. Can you make these ahead of time and reheat them? Yes, I did. I made these about three hours ago, the ones I did, and uh, I will show them to you when I'm Prove done. It. All you have to do is just no, reheat just them. Kidding. Now, <laughs> now they will get a little bit stiff once you do it. So okay. you can either add a little more cream or just a little bit of water to kind of reawaken them. But once you start getting them a little bit warm, that, I mean, there's an incredible amount of fat in there. It'll just kind of re-moisten them and just kind of, you know. So you can't, can you, you can you overheat them and will it, will they separate at all? It, I mean, there's a lot of dairy in them. So they can definitely, they'll definitely burn and they'll get, you'll get brown spots in the bottom of your pan. So definitely heat it over lower heat. 
Um, you can also throw them in the oven if you want a little more even heat. So probably it's a dry not heat. throw them in the microwave. You can, yeah, or okay. you can. Well, you can throw them in the microwave too if you wanted to. Should we? Should you do it like okay? Throw them in the microwave like a minute at a time and stir frequently, or you can absolutely same way you would do like tempering chocolate. Basically, you could just kind of do a little at a time. Um, I I usually keep it. I've got mine covered in a pan over there. So I basically just took my potatoes, once they were hot, I put a lid on it, just let them sit. Now they'll steam a little bit, but when I want to reheat them, I can just heat it back up, which I'll do now. So I'm going to turn this on, on a really low flame, which is relative with these 75,000 BTU burners. Low is, low is a relative term in here. Um, but yeah, you'll do it low, low and slow. Oh my gosh, so do you know Blake? Do you know Blake? Do you is know Blake? Blake? I don't know, but... So Blake just asked, I wonder if Scott hates salted butter more than iodized salt. <laughs> I don't hate, uh, I don't hate salted butter. I, I like to control the amount. The reason why, <laughs> usually I only ever work, in every restaurant I've ever worked at, unless you were working in the pastry department, usually they always were only using unsalted butter. Reason being, you want to be able to control the amount of salt that you're putting in the food. And a lot of times the ratio of, of butter to the salt in the butter can be a little bit off. And so you always want to just add to be able to control the salt in every turn. So that's why I like unsalted, but I don't hate, I got no, I, I have no hate for uh, salted butter. If salted butter has a time and a place and I love it. Look at this, I'm almost done. This is great. I'm like barely, um, I'm like barely sweating. I do have another question. So someone had a question, should they soak the potatoes in water before um, boiling them? Or was that just something you did for ease of prep today? Uh, I did it for ease of prep. What you want to do is you want to kind of, so these are, so we're using Yukon Golds, which have a, like a, I would say medium starch content. Um, if you are making French fries and you're going to use a rusted potato, I would absolutely soak okay. them if you're going to make potato chips because you want to make sure that you soak them enough to get some of that starch out, which can, if you're going to fry them, like in frying applications, can burn. So you want to try and get this as much starch as you can out. Um, also a quick tip on storing potatoes. Don't store them in the refrigerator because it concentrates the sugars. And if you were to store your uh, russets in the refrigerator and try to make French fries in two days after being in the refrigerator at under 41 degrees, you're going to have a really, they're going to be really, really brown. Here's a quick tip. Usually you want to store them on the, it, usually the typical thing for potatoes, like best environment for potatoes that last longer would be like 50 to 65 degrees, but that's not most people's houses. I wish it was my house, but it would be that cold all the time. <laughs> but no, it won't. So, all right, so I'm almost, I'm just mashing it through here. So see, you could use a ricer, but why? When you could have all this fun mashing it with a spatula. I think you did a great job, and I was really happy that Still you going. did that. Still going. Uh, the fun part of this is when I emulsify all the stuff into it. This is where, this is where you want to kind of see all the, the fun happen. All right. As I'm doing it, getting there. Um, I know our, our folks here, we've got about five people here in the audience. We're all socially distant. We're all uh, away. I but really I know you just want to eat these. I want I know to eat you can these smell. potatoes. <laughs> can you smell the prime rib? Can you smell that, like, you get a little bit of fat, a little bit of that Everything. Stuff going on? It smells amazing in here. It smells like Christmas dinner. Should you check your fennel? Or is it still okay? I don't want to. It wanna... smells good to me. I like it a little bit burned. All right, so this is going to be good I for now. I failed you on the cream, so I just oh, no, want to make fine. sure that it's I'm fine. doing Nobody my. Nobody failed. Nobody failed. We'll see how this all turns out. If I... No, we're good. That's okay. good. My roast. All right, I'm going to pull okay. out of the oven. I'm going to show you this all real right. fast. Here's how it's going to work. I'll move this guy out of the way. Move my cutting board over here. I'm going to get my super awesome wood carving board here. I'm going to cut a little chive. So remember, we had hot cream. I'm going to show you the potatoes. I've got some chives. I'm gonna cut a little chive here. We're getting close to the end. Bear with me, you've come so far. Uh, I can honestly say that being able to do this uh, for you guys is a awful treat for us and uh, it's a lot of fun. And um, you know, it's not every day we get to pass along some of the things that we've learned through a lot of uh, blood and sweat. Um, maybe a few tears, but uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to share uh, this with you. All right, here we go. Our tips and tricks. Here we go. The roast coming out. Holy mother of burl. Look at this thing. Let's All see right, it. Set on our wood here. Can you Ooh. see the uh, trying to get it close here? So remember how it looked when we first started, right? It was big and it was like we had a lot. We've obviously you can see the bone has shrunken a little bit. This is hot, so I'm gonna do it quick. Ooh, hot. So you can see there's like a little bit of the bone here. Also hot. It kind of Ooh. shrunk back a little bit. You can kind of see it. So it's, it'll, it comes back a little bit. All right, so I've got my chives. I'm gonna cut this in a second. The cream, here we go. Through a strainer. Again, all that flavor. All that flavor. Obviously, I've, I left a little bit out. I've probably got a couple pounds here, so I'm just gonna eyeball it. I'm gonna let that start with this. 
So earlier you said about a cup of cream per pound of potatoes, right? Yeah, it's kind of ish. Okay. Yeah, more more ish. All right, so I'm gonna just gonna start mixing this around, and you uh, you will be amazed at just how much liquid and fat these potatoes will absorb. So we'll just kind of get it all mixed before I slosh it around. All right, can you see a little better? Here we go. Oh, we have a really great question, and yeah. this is even this is from Christina, and it's even hard for chefs, but she has she asked if we have any tips when preparing a large meal for getting all of the dishes out at once while still being warm and fresh, right? Yes. So that's, lots of people struggle with that. It's a great question. Yep, do it in phases. So we do, uh, so anything that can be done ahead of time, all your vinaigrettes, anything that's like, any sauces like that that you can make ahead of time, you can always just reheat them. Um, you can even do, uh, you know, like typically when we would make uh, chicken in the restaurant, you'd sear off or kind of par cook your chicken and you'd finish it, uh, which, you know, you call you, when they fire the ticket, you'd, put it in there and then you finish it off. But you can make a lot of this stuff ahead of time. You can make the mashed potatoes ahead of time. You could roast the fennel ahead of time. And then before the guests get over here, you just put it back in the oven to kind of reflash yeah. it. And then you, what you really want to be to be fresh, was it Jessica, is that right? No, um, who was just asking the question? I can't remember who it was. It um, what, what you really want it to be fresh is always just the meat. Whatever the main dish is, you just want to make sure that is, you know, if you wait to the last second, you're going to redo it. Make sure that always comes out nice and hot. I think people are a little more forgiving about uh, this needs to rest our little thing here. So you see what I'm doing here? So you see how all that butter's going in there. So right now I'm over, I'm over, uh, I'm over four ounces of butter. We're working on two sticks of butter here. I'll do a little more of that cream. And again, when I finish, the mashed potatoes are just gonna be this beautiful, light, fluffy, creamy color. And you're not gonna have anything in there besides a little bit of that contrast of the uh, green from the chive. All right. So we're just whipping, whipping, whipping. And so now all I would do is add this, once it's done, to a pot, cover it, let it sit, keep it warm. And then when it comes up, like before you're about to serve, you'd add your chives, like I'm gonna do right now. Get all my chives in there. Look how beautiful Andrew this had is. a quick question yes. about um, what difference does a roasting rack actually make? So using a rack or not a rack? Using a rack versus, honestly, when it comes to turkeys and chickens and things, I would use a rack because it just kind of keeps the, you want the bird to be a little drier, like is it, or kind of, you know, just, just to be kind of up a little bit so that all those pan juices drip. For beef, I don't know, I kind of like it sitting in the fat for roast. I think it's completely up to you. Um, when I do my chickens and turkeys, typically what I'll do is I'll lay out like all the carrots, onions, celery, and I'll just put the chickens or the turkey right on top of that instead of using a rack. But you can, there's a lot of great, I mean, we sell, our roasting pans we use, they have a lot of great racks that are in there. So I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with using them, but I think it's just kind of personal preference. Andrew, I, like I made him it. use that rack. I'm sorry, I made him. He said he wasn't gonna use it, I made him do that. it. All right, so I'm gonna try and use my tongs. If I can get this guy up here. Uh, this is the one we cooked earlier. Watch this. Don't try this at home. I mean, try it at home, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we encourage you to try it at home. All right, so we're just gonna go, uh, let's go right. Holy moly. Oh, here it comes, wait for it. Wait for it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Ta-da! Ooh, the juices, look at that. Look at all the juices. So normally we would let this rest a little bit longer. We would carve it up and we would serve it with a little bit of our sauce here. Now what I would do with this, I would take our sauce, I would add a little bit of the fat, put it in a little pan, get it nice and bubbly, and then as I'm serving it, just slice and just kind of drizzle it over the top. Does that all make sense? Was that fast? I know it was fast. We got a lot done. We got the mashed yeah, potatoes done. Pull that fennel, fennel out oh, fennel, so I can see those, put fennel, those the fennel, the fennel. We bread the crumbs fennel, on fennel. there. I'm gonna get the bread crumbs, wait for it. This oh is my how we gosh. plate this. Plate the fennel. And I will take a bite of the fennel actually, because the fennel Lauren delicious. says that looks amazing. It's not, I don't think it's gonna be bad. I definitely, if I had to, if I had to just make a judgment call, that's what happens when your hands are. <laughs> <laughs> See what happened with the luck? See, I think that's something hey, I should have thrown over the some, right shoulder. Do you need made some fun of it. oven mitts for this? Nope. Okay. This is actually hot. So if you if you if I if I try to play the trick on you again, where I'm not actually holding it, I am gonna burn myself. Okay. I'll do one of those. Hi. All right. So there's the fennel. I'm gonna throw a little bit of our crumbs over the top. So again, there's a little contrast. There's the bacon, okay. and you will not have the same anisey flavor. I promise you. Once it gets roasted. So guys, that is it. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Charlotte Samuel, for moderating and uh, taking all the questions. Thank you to those of you that, uh, that asked questions. Uh, I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned something. 
If you want to go back at any, any point and rewatch any of this stuff, it will be on our YouTube channel, whoops, um, which is really simple. And again, we thank you guys for, uh, for bearing with us and all of our, uh, all, of, uh, all of the little things that could happen in a live You're a live getting show. a ton of thank yous right now, we, but uh, somebody wants to see you. that fennel. Somebody wants, Rose wants to see what that fennel looks I'm gonna like. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with my bare hands. My bare hands. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, he's going to eat on camera. Oh, that oh, happened. Uh, we're going to stick oh, around for a couple of minutes for any um, questions that anybody might have. Blake, that's good and salty. Oh, did you hear that, Blake? Mm. All right. That's it. Any questions, guys? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thursday and Friday, we have two more classes coming up. Check the website, egb.com slash classes for more information. Um, thank you again so much for spending... Uh, your time with us here. We're very humble to have you uh, with us and we'll have so you back much. for the next ones. Thanks guys. Thank you, Tompkins. Thank you.